Zoe, <laughs> thanks, thanks for sitting down with me today. Thanks for um, having me. Tell me a little about your musical career. How did you get to where you are today as an artist from when you started learning the cello? Um, well, I started playing the cello when I was seven. And, you know, like many musicians, I had a sort of a, you know, classical teenage career where you play in orchestras and audition and what have you. And then I decided not to pursue music as a career, and I just went off to do liberal arts. Um, and then I came out to San Francisco in the 90s. And, and you have a background doing information science stuff well, too, right? Well, I came out to San Francisco and the, the dot-com boom was happening. And it was like, do, the dot-com boom like saved liberal arts grads. <laughs> like, what could a liberal arts graduate do? Oh, I could work at a software startup where nobody knows what they're doing. And um, so uh, the CEO of the company kind of joked that they hired me as their admin. Um, and he said that I was the worst admin they'd ever had. <laughs> and they, he said I might do better in engineering. And so he put me in the engineering <laughs> department where I learned how to do some programming and I became an information architect. Um, and it suited me really well and I loved it. And all through that time I was a musician. Um, and after the crash, that first crash, I um, uh, took some time off just to pursue my music career and I realized that I'd spent all this time working so hard and that you know, I really should dedicate some time to music. And I used that kind of couple year period of not knowing what I was doing to just sort of, you know, make the music that I wanted to make. And that's what I've been doing ever since. And um, I uh, initially um, released some music and I thought I'd shop it around to record labels and what have you. And I was not unknown. I worked with some other artists and um, I was a session cellist and worked with some other bands that were pretty well known. Um, and uh, nobody was interested unless I kind of took my clothes off or sang and you know there was just not a lot of interest in people who wanted to change it and I said you know what I don't I'll just do this myself I really believe that I had an audience and so I put the music out online um, that was 2005 and that's what I've been doing ever since and, and your music I mean it's not fairly st it's not what no people normally think of when they hear cello it's not like yo-yo no. performs right it's got that, guts to it and that's part of the thing yeah. I mean there's no there was no place for it like it, I couldn't tell you what genre it was and Every artist thinks they're unique, but I do think that it's, it's, it's really hard to place my music. And in a way, this, this new mode of distributing stuff yourself suited me perfectly. So um, how did your first fans find you? Um, initially, it was, you know, just word, it was, it's always been word of mouth, I think. Um, I played in San Francisco in my house. Um, I started with these, again, I couldn't get a gig, so I lived in a warehouse in the city and um, started inviting friends over to my concerts, um, setting up a performance space in, the, in my warehouse. Um, and they got bigger and bigger and bigger until you know, we had like 200 Did you start people. charging the friends? Um, I d always did donation only. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, <laughs> you've got a unique perspective on this because it's an unusual niche and you also look at things with a little bit of a data analyst, like understanding the technology side I of it. I think so. Um, and now that music's gone almost entirely digital, yeah. um, what would you like to know about the where your music winds up? What would I like to know? Well, so one thing is right now it's really hard to figure out where people are. Um, because an artist like myself, is, we do everything online, I'm not um, really location-based. I can live anywhere. I can play in almost any city. And it's really hard to say where my listeners are, and it's always hard to know where to go next. Um, and uh, I would love it if there was, it was m easier for me to get information about where people are and where people are at a g any given moment, because that's changing over time. Um, and in general, um, I always liked selling music myself to artists, and in exchange, in the beginning, I would you know offer an MP3 in exchange for an email, because being able to reach people directly is always the thing. Right. <laughs> um, and the issues that I have right now are not around problems of discovery. Um, it's more around problems of how do I tell the people who are already listeners? Right. Because people don't check email anymore, or like their mode of listening is changing, and it's, it's increasingly hard to reach the people who are already your fans, um, to know like both where they are and how to reach them. And um, a lot of the sort of large music services haven't necessarily made that problem any easier. In fact, they're making it harder by perhaps removing my ability entirely to even find out anything. Um, and you don't find that social platforms like uh, Twitter or Facebook are good ways to meet them? Or um, find them? I mean, you can, you can write to people and say, like, hey, I'm doing this at that one moment you know, for Twitter. Who knows who's there at any given time? I, I've always taken the, um, the tactic of, like, I don't, um, I'm not one of those people who post the same thing over and over again through the course of the day. I, I really use the tools organically. Um, that might be a mistake, but I use them organically as to, like, to talk about things. And Twitter, in some ways, I've never really used Twitter as a promotional platform. I use it as a way to kind of chit chat and post photographs and 
I still read my feed to see what's happening. I'm one of those people who, you know, and I'm trying to always change my filter bubble so that it's not right. too like narrow. Um, and uh, Facebook is kind of similar in a way. I just I just talk about stuff. I don't always talk about music. So um, the other the other aspect of data one is analytics, like where are my fans yeah. to reach them physically. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go on tour. I want to see them. Whatever. The other is to sort of know where they want you to go next. How right. does feedback from the audience lead to you changing what you perform or how you perform? Does that does it compromise um, your artistic integrity or is it? No, I, d I don't think so. Actually, um, maybe here's an anecdote. When I um, uh, back in 2007, this artist, Imogen Heap, asked me to tour with her out of the blue. Um, and it turned out that she had, a friend had given her my album, and she really liked it. And then she sent me an email saying, oh, you know, I, lo I love your stuff, you know. <laughs> and, um, and I was like, Imogen Heap, I was like, I love you. I said, if you ever need each other, please let me know. And then she said, well, actually, I'm going on tour in two weeks. Could you join me? And I was like, of course. And she was doing her first US tour. Um, wow. And uh, it was going to be on Letterman. It was going to launch from Letterman and then go off. And um, so I met her. And I quickly, she had a completely different audience than I did. I had sort of this horizontal San Francisco warehouse audience, meaning horizontal, it was an after party scene. Right. It'd be like 4 o'clock in the morning, you're lying down, <laughs> you're really receptive to like 20 minute long pieces of music, right? right. Um, her audience was like 13 and 14 year old girls <laughs> who have like a 30 second attention span. And um, I'm doing layered telemusic with a computer, which takes a long time to develop because I have to record each layer sequentially. Right. Um, and uh, our early concerts, it's not that they'd went badly, but it's just that I had a hard time holding the attention of the audience. Um, and I discovered that um, to sort of not please them, but to hold people's attention, I started making things shorter. So I was like, OK, four minutes. Things have to happen at a certain pace. Right. And I had to talk to people. I had to talk to the audience. I, n I was m mortified. Did I was you narrate what you were doing? Like, here's a loop, yeah. and here's a loop? Or? Well, my, my computer was always crashing. So, oh. um, so I'd talk about what was happening. And um, I, was, I sort of developed this stage persona that was about sort of the process and how it sometimes goes wrong. Right. And, um, and then the actual music itself. And that actually ended up being a winning formula, but it would not have occurred if I hadn't had this audience that I was playing for. So, um, and I think actually being forced to make something in a, like a short four to five minute format m forced me to crystallize my ideas yeah. to make them better. Um, so that's just one example. But that sounds like the kind of feedback that would have happened from any artist performing live. In Perhaps, some cases, you know, if you're, but if you're Simon Cowell, yeah. You look yeah. at the data and decide what kind of boy band you need next week. That's yeah. a very different approach from like other artists have told me. Uh, I want to use music to go and find my fans once I've finished the creative process, as mm. opposed to I want to change my creative process in order to find a certain class of fan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think I'm looking for any particular. It's more like that's more like um, you know, I think any performer really enjoys performing, and you want to be effective at what you're doing. And so, if you end up morphing what you're doing to to get better response. That's that's really what it is. So, so. Uh, I'm going to be talking to Amanda Palmer in a, in a few minutes, yeah. and she has a very. You're both independent artists who control your own content much more than many people who have yeah. a label relationship. Yeah, I control all of it. But you have <laughs> very different approaches to mm -hmm. how you'd like to get paid, and, and some of that is, I guess, you're right. you're selling soundtracks that get used in television. You're doing TV composition. Mm -hmm. She said to me earlier that she's like, you know, she started as a street hus hustler, so she's yeah. like, give me a dollar now, right? Yeah. Uh, how do you think? artists will get paid in the future now that we have this sort of digital tracking of music? Yeah, well, the digital tracking of, war of music isn't necessarily fully formed yet. I think we're actually still in the infancy of what the music industry is going to be like. We've had like a great decade of disruption that has benefited artists like me and Amanda. Um, um, I'm not sure that she or I could have had the kind of careers we have without this you know, thing that has been bad for some other artists, right? right. Um, but I don't think that things are fully realized yet. I still don't. Um, right now, it's still the case that the majority of the money is going to people other than the content creators. <laughs> Ber Berkeley said 73% of money goes to the label, not to the artist. That sounds yeah, that sounds about right. But it's not even just labels. It's like um, we talked we talked about this in the session, like that we were at. There was the performing rights organizations. They take you know money from all these different sources, and then they're supposed to give it to the artists whose music is actually being played, but. They're not tracking everything, and it's a black box how they make those calculations. So actually, the money goes to 
the people who have the most powerful managers or the people who are really squeaky. So like <laughs> in my case, I kind of went squeaky. And so I had an issue with ASCAP where I realized that all this money that I was paying them every time I play in a concert hall, I can see the line item there on the contract saying you know, $150 to ASCAP. And I asked them publicly, <laughs> where does that money go? Because I've never seen anything from you. Um, and uh, what do you know? I got a phone call, and a few months later, I started getting a check for that. <laughs> so that's how they work. Right. And that's, that's not the 21st century. There's no reason why we can't actually pay for usage, just like we do for everything else. And right. so I'm, I'm actually I'm optimistic about the future, but I think that people like me and the Amanda Palmers, everybody needs to be involved in what do we want the digital music economy to do for us? What do we need? How do we want it to work? Um, because if, if, if we're not involved in this, then the people who have a lot of the money at stake, who, who are getting all the money, they're just going to make the world for us, and then we have to adapt. Um, and I don't think that that's really the way that I want things to go. So that's, why, that's why I speak up. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so. so one last quick question. I know we're moving from a world of music as content you purchase and own mm -hmm. to music as content that you have a license for, but like yeah. who knows when I die what happens. Someone's got to buy my catalog again. Right. To music as a service uh -huh. where I'm listening to a stream, Spotify, whatever else, and all the data points to a massive shift away from yeah. CDs through digital downloads and now to services. Yeah. It seems like with music as a service, the, the, the people who are paying you are also the ones that see the play button. Mm -hmm. And as a result, there's no excuse anymore right. for no, yeah. not knowing what you did. Yeah, because yeah we the know what everyone's right doing. There. Yeah, we know what everyone's doing. Is there <laughs> right. any reason for, so in the old days, the licensing system, you had an artist's collection agency that would sort of mm -hmm. take the data and, in theory, distribute it equitably across artists based on usage. Is there any reason for any of that to exist at, at a, in a world where Spotify knows exactly how many people listen to more than 30 seconds of a song of yours? Um, well, I think right now with those collection agencies and what have you, or and then sound exchange, they <laughs> um, make it imperative for those companies to distribute the money. Um, I'm, I do worry that without them, there might not be, they would find some reason not to pay me. Um, <laughs> so that's not to say that they need to exist, but again, going back to this, like it should be like an equitable system where a listen is logged, and whether you get there should be some decision as is it, is it paid? Is it what what is the compensation for that listen? Is is it money or otherwise? Um, and uh, we we just don't have that system yet. But yeah, we're going towards a I guess I guess service is a way to think of it. As um, an artist, would you want to have control over like hey, you know hey if it's a student and they can prove they're a student they can listen to my music for free? Like would you like to have more yeah, opinions about how your music gets used? Right. Well, for example, um, you know a lot of my. Uh, um, the usage of my music is in like synchronization licensing. Um, and I have a licensing agent who takes care of the big stuff, like the, the TV shows, the ads, that kind of stuff. And then um, I let individuals and YouTube take care of the small scale licensing. So like YouTube with their content management system, that they just find all the uses of my music, all the 10,000 videos that have my music in them. They find that for me. Um, and then some people just write to me directly. And I always say, like, if they're a student, if it's an art project, if it's something a nonprofit, yes, just go ahead. Um, and but you two came to you with that. They said, hey, I have a bag full of 10,000 yeah. videos for you. Right. Right. You didn't go I looking oh, for I had, it earlier? I had no idea. Oh. Yeah. I'm like the only artist on the face of the earth who's never made a video. Never made a video. Other than this one. Yeah. yeah. But I mean like a music video. I know. <laughs> um, so uh, <laughs> you're optimistic about the future of music? Yeah, I think so. I'd like to really encourage more um, artists to be involved in the discussion, to think about what do you want? Like, what do you want? Can you just try to, it's almost like we need a um, music futurists to try to envision the future of like, what might your life be like? How might it work? Like, how might you make money? Like, just think about it in like a, a free form way without all the um, emotion attached to it. Because often you've probably experienced like numerous music conferences where it kind of devolves into name calling and people are upset right. and they get anxious. And we had a little bit of that today and it, we don't even have a lot of stakeholders here in the music industry. So well, Rishi Malhotra of <laughs> Savin said that this combination of big data plus digital music gives us this new industry he called music science, mm. which is all about sort of prediction algorithms and music, music detection. And it does seem like there's a, there's a huge increase in mm -hmm in the technology being applied to music for tracking, for discovery, yeah. for recommendations, and so on, that's, that's changing the landscape a lot. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we've talked the ethics of it enough. Right. And, and so I, I would like to see more, um, more kind of platforms, more forums to really discuss this. Um, right now, the, the, uh, the discussions that I've been a part of are still very polarized. You still have like the techie ones, and you have the music ones. And there's not a lot of um, you know, cross-pollinization between them. Um, they're still kind of adversarial. So 
um, I'm just trying to encourage like a little open-mindedness and a little like visionary thinking about like thinking about this as a, a musician and a content creator, thinking about this from a um, you know app creation way. Right. You know, like what about this? What about this? What about this? You know, how could we do? You're just just thinking about it that way. Sure. So awesome. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks for having me. Nice to talk to you. You too. <laughs>